Good afternoon. Welcome back to another rendition of the BNH virtual event space. You see it's panel style. That means we're talking a new product release. Today we have Sigma in the house. So welcome, Liam. Welcome, Aaron. Good to have you guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks uh, for having us. Of course, these guys are no strangers to the virtual event space. It's good to have them back. And today we are talking gear. So we have the new Sigma Sport 150 to 600 millimeter F5 to 6.3 DG DN OS Ultra telephoto lens. Whew, take a deep breath. Uh, joining me, of course, Sigma Pro photographer Liam Duran, who is outdoor <laughs> action, adventure, travel. We're going to be talking moose photos today. I, I love moose. So Liam's got some moose photos to show us later. And also landscape photographer from Sigma, the man himself, Aaron Norberg. Again, welcome, you guys. Huge thank you to Sigma for sponsoring today's event. And I want to give a special hello to everybody joining us live on YouTube and live stream and Facebook. So anybody that has any questions about out there about this lens in particular, Anything Sigma gear in general, I think we can get it answered for you today. We got the panel to do it. So feel free to get those questions in, drop them in the comments section, but we're going to get it started. Aaron, I'll kick it over to you. Just tell everybody watching a little bit about yourself. Uh, sure. Yeah. Hey, uh, my name is Aaron Norberg. I am Sigma's tech rep in the Northwest. I'm based out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, so I basically do all the dealer support for the dealers in the Northwest. Um, and then also handle a lot of our virtual events uh, and training for new products like this. Wonderful. And, and as I said, Aaron is no stranger to the event space. You guys might catch him giving wonderful and always positive image critiques and teaching us about photography from all angles. Uh, we also are joined by Liam Duran. Liam is a Sigma pro photographer. Liam, tell us where you're coming to us from and a little bit about your work. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Um, I live in Breckenridge, Colorado. And like you said in the intro, I shoot, um, I'm an outdoor photographer. So I shoot a lot of action sports. So that's skiing, mountain biking, fly fishing, trail running, that sort of thing. I also shoot a lot of landscapes, wildlife, nature, and, um, uh, and adventure travel in general. So yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's what I do for a living. Awesome. So it's like Nat Geo drink and energy drink and that's it's something like that. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, yeah, I like that. <laughs> so today we're talking a super, super, super long telephoto zoom lens. I, I always, I mean, these lenses are always, lenses are always impressive to me, cover such a range. Uh, we are going to get in some images later, but I do want to get to the specs first. So Aaron, I'm going to kick it over to you. Tell us a little bit about the, you know, the creation of this lens or the, the reiteration of this lens from the DSLR version, what we're looking at and a little bit uh, about it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so this is the 150 to 600 DG DN sports. Uh, so the, the, biggest thing to take out of all that nomenclature there is the DN designation. And in our lineup, that means it's a lens that was designed specifically for the shorter flange distances that we see in mirrorless cameras. Uh, so we do have, if you're familiar with our lineup, you probably know we've got a couple lenses already in the DSLR lineup. We have both the contemporary and the sport version of a 150 to 600, as well as uh, the 60 to 600 sport. So uh, over the last couple of years, our engineers have really been tasking themselves with redesigning uh, the focal lengths that we have in the DSLR lineup for uh, emerging mirrorless platforms. Uh, and in this case, I think it's a really great um, indication of some of the benefits <clears throat> that we can see when those optics are designed specifically for those newer platforms as I think really what stands out uh, immediately to me with this lens relative to our other lenses is that it really combines kind of the best of both worlds with our existing 150 to 600s, the contemporary and the sport. Uh, those lenses have been out for a while. They've been pretty well received, I'd say across the board, but they do kind of split the herd a little bit in terms of uh, who goes what direction. The sport series lens uh, is a very robust build. It's a metal body, it's fully weather sealed, uh, but that material difference, the metal body also makes it a little on the heavier side. Uh, the contemporary version, it's same focal length, same aperture value, but because the contemporary lenses are designed to be more lightweight and portable for everyday use, uh, that lens is a composite body. It doesn't feature the extensive weather sealing of the sports version. And that material difference between the two of those existing um, iterations led to about a two pound weight difference. And for a lot of people, that was kind of the divining wow. yeah, spec. So uh, <laughs> this new DGDN version, uh, it kind of bridges the gap between the two. It offers the same relative size as our lightweight contemporary version, but with all of the, the robust build and the weather sealing of the sports series. So you kind of get the best of both worlds there. Uh, it is our first hyper telephoto focal length for mirrorless platforms. It's also the first sport series lens that we've released for mirrorless platforms. So there's a handful of uh, 
really exciting things to see developing with this lens. Uh, there are also a number of uh, user controls that we haven't seen or haven't seen in quite the same combination before, uh, which we can go into in a minute. But I think, yeah, what really, what really sells it for me is uh, you get the lightweight, uh, more compact profile of the contemporary version with all of the robust build and durability of the sports series. And on top of that, I think the thing that we're all really uh, most concerned about is image quality. They've managed to improve uh, in basically every metric that we can measure on the existing versions. This lens gives you uh, the more compact profile, the robust build, but it also gives you the best image quality of any of our lenses that go out to 600 uh, to date. So it's something I'm really excited to see and really excited to see what, what uh, the rest of the world <laughs> thinks about it. I think it's gonna be a pretty exciting uh, addition to the marketplace. Definitely. I think, I think the internet's probably already clamoring. It doesn't take the, the comment <laughs> sections to get going out there, YouTube and all the forums. Now, yeah. Liam, with your work, I mean, Aaron did talk about two key things there, especially when, when I see 150 to 600, the first thing I'm thinking is like, you're carrying it around, like, you know, like over your shoulder and you're out there, you're trekking. I'm, I'm guessing a lot of places that you are, are shooting and you're hiking to, or it's some kind of trek, but there's yeah. also that yeah, yeah. quality. So, um, yeah, I, I hike, you know, it, up high in the mountains. Um, you know, sometimes I'm deep in the backcountry. Sometimes I'm just off the side of the road, wherever it may be. Um, for this lens, I even shot it on a mountain biking shoot, which is not something I probably would have done with the DSLR version because it was quite big and quite heavy and it was hard to move around. Um, you know, I made a video for YouTube and so did Sigma. And in both of our versions of that video, you'll see me mountain biking with a 600 millimeter lens, which not that long ago is kind of a ridiculous thing to even like contemplate, right? Um, here it is right here, in case you're wondering, I just have it. Well, probably oh, yeah, huge, not... I stick it out here and it looks enormous, but yeah. So it's really not <laughs> that big. That's with the lens hood on. Um, so yeah, like when I got it, when I pulled it out of the box, without a doubt, the very first thing I noticed is like, wow, this is way smaller and way lighter than its predecessor. So that, that's, that's the first thing that anyone that gets this lens, it's a, you are going to notice that immediately. What, what is, is size ultimately king for you when you're out there? How much, how much does image quality play in all the, I mean, we're going to get to all the other little nuances and specs. I know Aaron, you kind of touched upon all the customization dials and switches on there that we'll, we'll get to in a bit, but what, when you got a, your hands on a lens, Liam, what's the first thing you gravitate towards checking out? It, you know, it really depends on what the lens is, but overall I'm going to say image quality. Um, generally weight and size will take kind of a secondary uh, position to the image quality. Um, you know, for example, the original version of the 150 600, I shot that a ton and it was a very nice lens. It was very big and I shot it always on a tripod. And most of the time I was shooting that, you know, for roadside photography, you know, if I'm at a national park or something like that, that's generally where I use that lens. Um, with this new iteration, this is something that I will it's just way more portable. I will put this in a backpack and take it up the mountain with me. And that is something I didn't really do that often with the original version. But, um, but yeah, the, the king for me and probably for every photographer is the image quality. Um, and, uh, and I got to say, it's spectacular. Now, Aaron, can you go a little bit into, you know, without... Without, uh, you know, getting too crazy into the technical side, I mean, you do have to bring up the, the you know, the internal makeup of it, the, the elements, what, you know, what kind of coding you're putting on there, because we're talking about image quality, and that is all due to how it's made, what's, what's on the inside. So what does the makeup of this lens look like from the inside out? You know, it's not terribly different on paper uh, from the existing 150 to 600. The existing 150 to 600 for the uh, DSLR, um, lineup was a 24 element arrangement in uh, 16 groups. And this one is 25 elements in 15 groups. So it doesn't seem like it's a huge difference, but if you take a look at the optical formula side by side, the, the arrangement of those elements is completely different. Uh, there's another, I think, pretty significant difference in just the size of the formula. Uh, the front elements on the existing 150 to 600 was a 105. Uh, the current, the new DGDN version is a smaller 95. So that there is, it's almost a half an inch difference in diameter of the lens. And that's a pretty significant uh, decrease in size. 
But uh, I'd say the other thing that kind of stood out to me beyond how different the arrangement of the elements is, uh, the low dispersion elements that we use, we use three grades in our designs. We have um, uh, ELD, which would be like extra low dispersion, SLD, super low dispersion, and then FLD, which is like a fluoride equivalent. Uh, and in the DSLR version, the 150 to 600 Sport, we saw uh, more SLD elements and a few uh, FLD. And FLD would be basically the highest tier um, low dispersion element that we use. And these low dispersion elements, I guess I should say, if you're not familiar, uh, they're much more effective at bringing all the different wavelengths of color that are present in light back into phase on the same plane. Uh, so when that doesn't happen, that's when we tend to see more like chromatic aberration or color fringing. Uh, so these FLD elements, these are our top tier, basically um, exotic glass elements. There are twice as many of those elements in this new design relative to the existing sports series for the uh, DSLR realm. And I think where that's really, uh, where that shows to me, if you look at the MTF charts, and that's another thing that's a little bit of a deep dive, but um, all three of these lenses, the 150 to 600, the Contemporary, the Sport, and the new DGDN Sport, they're all exceptionally good performers. But where this one really, I think, stands out is how consistent it is. Almost every lens is going to have some degree of fall off as you go from the center of the imaging frame out to the edge, and especially when you're shooting closer to your wider apertures. This lens exhibits a, as close to a flat MTF chart. Um, and what that means is basically that there's very little variation from the center to the edge of the imaging frame, even at your maximum aperture. So this lens, I think, is going to be something that looks quite a bit sharper, even though the existing lenses were very sharp in the center, this lens holds it up much better out to the edges of the frame. Uh, another thing, especially for anyone shooting mirrorless platforms, the fact that this is a native <laughs> design and a native protocol for these mirrorless cameras is such an, a significant difference. I don't think it can be understated. Anyone adapting one of the DSLR versions of these lenses to a mirrorless platform, uh, your autofocus speed and autofocus accuracy is gonna be so much higher with mm -hmm. a native mount version of it. And it's something that I think is gonna be, for anyone who uses a lens with this kind of reach, um, it's something that's gonna be immediately apparent, the difference in how easy it is to track and follow a subject. And then once you get those images back, I think you're gonna be blown away by just uh, how sharp those images are, uh, regardless of where your subject is within the frame. Yeah, I can, I'm gonna have to second that too. Um, you know, I, I did use the, origi the, uh, the original DSLR version with the MC11 adapter and it worked fairly well. Don't get me wrong, it worked. I got lots of great shots with that setup. But now that we've removed the MC11 adapter and it's going right onto uh, the, the mirrorless body, it is significantly faster and more accurate. Uh, we did some mountain bike shooting and, you know, I had the athlete coming right at me at a very high rate of speed. She's just like going back and forth, whipping right at me. And it just tracked her the entire way. And it really kept up um, through the entire sequence. So I was really impressed with it. Leon, what body are you using it on? Uh, I, for everything that I shot, um, everything that you saw with any of the Sigma photos was all done on the Sony A9 II. Okay, so we're looking for this, we're looking E-mount and L-mount, correct, Aaron? That's correct, yes. At this point, uh, okay. all of our DGDN lenses would be available for Sony E-mount or the shared Leica L-mount that we share with um, Leica and Panasonic. Okay, and we, we had some questions coming in. Of course, you're always gonna have the, you know, your Canon, your Sony, your, your other mount users other than E-N-L. Um, is there, you know, options to adapt for those people who are on Z-mount and, and others? Sure. Uh, so. The Nikon and Canon ecosystems are both closed respectively. Those manufacturers don't open them up to other accessory manufacturers like ourselves. So at this point, um, if you want this kind of reach on an RF mount or a Z mount, your best bet is not to go with the DGDN version. These are lenses that are gonna be very difficult to adapt between <laughs> mirrorless mounts because the, the specifications from system to system are so close. It makes it really difficult to do. But our existing um, 150 to 600s or the 60 to 600 in either the Canon EF mount or the Nikon F mount, when used with each manufacturer's own adapters, taking their SLR mounts to their mirrorless mounts, work without any issues. Um, as Canon and Nikon continue to push in the direction of these uh, burgeoning mirrorless systems, I, I'm sure we're going to be there at some point as well. As 
that's where the customer base is going. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, I don't have any uh, insider information to share on how far out that may be. Uh, but I would say just personal speculation from what I can tell at least, um, it seems to me that the lenses that we're designing for the E-mount and the L-mount should theoretically be lenses that can also be made available for RF mount and Z-mount at some point. But uh, I'm sure there's quite a bit more going on behind the scenes than what I'm uh, privy to. I'm sure that they'll be there Definitely. at some point, but uh, at this point today, my recommendation would be to use their, the SLR lenses with the OEM adapters to go to those new mirrorless platforms. Yeah, well, as Liam said, I mean, you're still going to get, I think we, we set such a high standard for ourselves and not just quality, but really in, you know, getting all the technological advantages that these lenses, because like you said, it's lenses are now made catered to specific systems so that all the benefits of that system you're getting in, in the lenses working hand in hand. So, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm, I'm an old legacy glass guy. So for years, it's like, oh, I don't have autofocus. All right, fine. I'll manually focus. <laughs> but uh, not everybody's the same. Now, I do want to transition to the the form factor and the out, you know, the outside body of the lens, the features on there. So we've got some interesting features there, Aaron. Can you take us a little yeah. bit through those? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so like any of our other telephoto lenses, uh, you'll have kind of the standard feature set. You've got autofocus, manual focus control. We have a focus limiter that allows you to go between the full range near to far that the lens is capable of focusing through. Uh, you also then have two positions that you can limit it to. Uh, you can either limit it to the far half or the near half. So when you're shooting in situations that would have potentially low contrast or situations that have a lot of depth that your camera may uh, have a hard time figuring out where in that scene you're trying to focus, limiting the range that the lens is going to try to focus through can speed up acquisition and can speed up tracking. So though that's a hard switch on the lens. Uh, below that, we also have our optical stabilizer. We have two modes. Uh, one would be kind of standard all directions. It's gonna try to sense and correct for any motion. And then we have, uh, an OS2 setting, which would be for like active panning. So if you're trying to follow a subject in motion, the lens will recognize which direction you're moving in and it won't try to correct for that range or for that um, axis. Uh, and then we have a couple unique features to this lens. Uh, so I think the first one that might not seem obvious if you're familiar with our lenses, just below all those switches we just went through, we also have a custom function switch. And that's something that has been present on our DSLR lenses in these kind of focal lengths, but something we haven't seen yet in the mirrorless lenses. So that's kind of one of the first things I would uh, draw attention to. On the Sony E-mount platform, uh, so this, this switch, sorry, I should say, has two positions uh, for C1 and C2, and then it also has an off position. So in off, the, the lens is gonna be just you know factory standard like it was out of the box. For the Sony E-mount platform, um, the C1 and C2 positions are going to control uh, the optical stabilization modes. So for C1, we can have it set then to uh, dynamic view mode, which means the lens is going to try to uh, move those stabilizers to the maximum effect. So it's gonna be able to compensate for even more motion there. But because of the way that optical stabilization works in the lens, uh, where there's essentially, there's a lens element that's moving around in the assembly to compensate for your handheld motion, uh, as those optics move, it can also cause the image that's reaching the sensor to shift slightly. And sometimes that can be either um, off-putting if you're not used to seeing that, or if you're trying to be really particular about what's on the edges of your frame, that can be counterproductive. Um, so then we also have the C2 position for Sony E-mount um, applications would be what we call moderate view mode. And in moderate view mode, the stabilizers are going to stabilize sooner. So there's no movement in the viewfinder. It's gonna look rock solid but because it's stabilizing them before the actual point of capture, it generally won't be able to compensate for quite as much motion. And then for the L-mount shooters, you'll have the ability to customize those two positions with the USB dock accessory, just like what the DSLR lenses are used to. So not only can we affect those uh, stabilizer modes, like I just mentioned, we can also affect um, the autofocus tracking speed and we can set custom focus limits for people who are working in more controlled environments where they know relatively how far they're gonna be from their subject. Uh, another wow. thing that we've seen in some form before, but not quite like this, um, we've seen reprogrammable autofocus lock buttons on many of our DN lens releases. 
Uh, and if you're not familiar with that, uh, out of the box, it's gonna work as an AFL button on your camera body. So it will lock focus wherever it happens to be at that point. So if you're, especially if you're in a continuous focus mode, once you place focus on your subject, you can have it stay there regardless of any motion between you and your subject. Uh, so this, this lens has not only that uh, feature, but it has it repeated three times on various sides of the lens body. And it doesn't control three different you know, reprogrammable functions, they all reference the same function, but having it repeated across the lens means that regardless of what position you're holding the equipment in, that button is always gonna be within reach. So that's another nice kind of refinement, I think that people in the field, I think will really appreciate. And then the last thing that I'd mentioned that's totally unique uh, to this lens within our lineup and as far as I know within the marketplace is something called the zoom torque switch. Uh, and this is another switch that has three positions. They are labeled L, T, and S. Uh, and this controls how much resistance is on the zoom ring. So the L position is gonna be lock. It's basically like a zoom lock. In that position at 150, the lens won't move at all. So this would really be for transportation. It means that the lens won't move when you're not using it. It's not gonna extend or contract. Uh, the middle position T would be for tight control. So there's gonna be um, a little bit more friction than what you're probably used to with most lenses on that zoom ring. It's not so tight that you can't move it, but it's tight enough that the lens won't move under its own weight. So if you're not uh, having to move super quickly, um, that's a really good position. That's probably where I would have it in most instances because uh, it's still, it's easy to move around. It's just not quite as quick, but it's not gonna move under its own weight. So you can set it where you need to and not have to worry about it uh, moving somewhere else. And then the last position would be S for smooth. And in smooth, uh, there's going to be very little resistance on that zoom ring. So you'll be able to go very quickly throughout the entire range. But because it is looser, um, if you're shooting at an angle up or down, the lens may have some tendency to move on its own if you're not holding it. Uh, so that would be maybe an instance, once you get it where you want it, you can switch it back to tight um, to keep it from moving any further. That's the feature that jumped out to me when I saw all the, I mean, like you said, the other stuff we've kind of in some way, shape or form seen most of that or you know, we're used to it by now yeah. from the, the Sigma lenses, but that for people like me who are always, you know, I'm rubbing my camera along things. And like Liam, you said, you're, you might be throwing it in a backpack or, you know, strapped, you know, thrown across your back and your, your zoom is twisting. So something like that is, is big for me. Now for you, Liam, and your experience taking this lens out, out of all those features on the outside, are there any that are like second nature to you? You got to have them, anything you really like about that feature set? Um, well, you know, I use the zoom torque function quite a bit. That was kind of one that I used the most of all of them, honestly. Uh, when I was in the field, I would throw it into that tight setting. So when I walk around, so I, you know, photograph the moose for a little bit, then I'd kind of hold it by the foot and walk around to another angle. And it just wouldn't extend out and be bumping into logs or rocks or anything like that. And then when you picked it back up, it would be in the exact same spot. Like Aaron said, it wasn't just sliding all the way out to its maximum range, or if you picked it up, it wouldn't drop back down. So um, I use the zoom torque switch a lot over the last week or so. Okay. Now, look, I made it 23 minutes without talking about moose photos. So <laughs> Liam, I, you, you just mentioned it there. I'm going to, I'm going to have you, if you can start to get those, some photos queued up so we can take a look at some of these beautiful images. Um, and while you're doing that, Aaron, I just wanted to, to throw out to you, we did have a question regarding the uh, stepping motor, linear motor, what kind of motor is driving this lens? And is there a, you know, a reason why Sigma went in such direction? Uh, yeah, so this lens is using a stepping motor. Uh, that is a difference from what we saw with the DSLR versions, which both use what we call a hypersonic motor. Uh, hypersonic motors do tend to be faster to acquire focus and to track focus, and that they, they kind of snap right to uh, where they need to move to uh, pretty quickly. Uh, where stepping motors will move at a much more gradual pace. So there, there can be a little bit of a speed difference, um, but the main reason we're using stepping motors for most of our DN designs is because stepping motors, that gradual transition is much better suited to tracking continuous focus um, with how it's implemented in the Sony and um, Panasonic bodies that we're primarily seeing these lenses used with. Uh, and it's also those, Stepping motors, uh, those gradual transitions in focus tend to be much more uh, visually pleasing for video use. And that's really the big reason. We're seeing so much more uh, hybrid usage of these cameras of people doing equal parts video and stills or getting more into video. Um, 
that we just felt we were able to come up with a design that had a small enough focusing group element, uh, the elements that actually moved to achieve focus are small enough that the stepping motor uh, didn't really have any appreciable uh, speed difference relative to the hypersonic motors. And those gradual transitions are just so much more um, easy for the camera to keep tracking focus, but also easy on viewers if you are recording video, it's not so jerky uh, moving through the scene. Now, before we look at some images, Liam, is there anything on that, on the, the motor and the autofocus scene? I mean, you're working with Sony cameras, which are known for having just incredibly fast, accurate autofocus. And was this lens able to keep up with in the, your applications? out in the Yeah, it, absolutely. It was, um, you know, I, I can't speak to the difference between a linear and a stepping motor. I don't know. What I do know is are the images that I'm are downloading onto my computer, are they sharp? And, and yes, they are. Um, and ag again, in the vi video that Sigma released and the one that I did this morning um, on YouTube, you'll see we, and I can even pull it up right now, actually. Um, I have one of my athletes coming straight at me and I'll show you just what the stepping motor does <laughs> and every one of the images <laughs> of the athlete coming at you is perfectly sharp for i believe we get 15 uh frames a second on this setup here and that's incredibly fast and it's incredibly good um i you know i work professionally in this field and i'm you know for me and for anyone else this is as good as you're ever going to need like there might be something faster i don't know but um but I, I'm not asking for any more, to be honest with you. And I can, in fact, if you want me to do a sheet screen share, I can show you exactly what I'm talking okay. about. Yeah. Yes. Let's, let's move into show and tell. And I'll remind everybody <laughs> uh, we'll get, to, we'll get to any questions we can. So get your questions in. We've had a lot of questions come in. So I want to thank everybody for not only just watching, but getting involved. Uh, keep, keep the questions coming and we'll yeah. uh, I'm going to shift over here and, and, and okay. enjoy the show with you guys. I'll, uh, I'll hit the screen share here and let's see go. I'm going to pull this guy over. Uh, can you guys see that? Yep. And I have no idea what this looks like on, you know, from my computer through B&H over to YouTube, <laughs> Facebook. I have no idea if the quality is still there. It's still there. You'll have to take my word for it. <laughs> but here's what we're looking at. So this is a really hard thing for a lot of lenses to do because you're doing it. And correct me if I'm wrong here, Aaron, but there's some predictive AF going here as the athlete comes at you. So this is a challenging thing for a lens and a camera to achieve and, and it did it awesome. So here we go. Uh, it's a little slower on this version, but. It's given so, us a chance to process that beauty. Yeah, well, she's covering about 60 feet here in all the, in everything wow. you're about to see. So that's a lot oh and i got one that's slightly warmer there at the end of course yeah, but um but that gives quality. you guys an idea at least like boot, that's 32 shots in a row of her you know in real life obviously obviously she's moving very fast um and every one of them is publishably sharp i think i just made that word up publishably uh, <laughs> but anyhow uh so here's kind of just a little bit of what i did over the week you know we were talking a little bit about chromatic oh and when you wanted to see the moose of course Hey, there we go. This is one of the biggest moose I have ever seen in Colorado, God. if not the biggest moose I've ever seen. The paddles were enormous, um, like comically so. Um, we were talking about chromatic aberration, and I, I shoot a lot of backlit shots. So you would expect, you know, sometimes if you're going to see some of that chromatic aberration, it's going to be here in the paddles. Um, and we just, it just wasn't there. Like those are so clean. There's no purple fringing, no green fringing. It's just absolutely nice and clean um, all around the edge there. So really impressive. Um, wow. And then, you Especially know, just the over overall general sharpness of this lens is just fantastic. I mean, here, I mean, the, the eye, everything is super sharp. You know, again, I don't know how this looks coming through all the various forms, but it is extremely sharp on my monitor. Um, you know, you can see, you can count the hairs on his face. Um, you can see his eyelashes right here. I mean, it's just amazing. I should say her, this is actually a you. Um, and then it's got a nice soft creamy bouquet, uh, bokeh in the background there. That looks really nice. Um, again, here's some tracking images, you know, your athletes coming at you at a very high rate of speed. Let me get that out of there. 
and it just tracks and follows very, very well. Uh, again, I would not hesitate to use this in any professional setting for any assignment that I would have. Same thing, just a little bit closer here, um, just coming straight at you. What else? Oh, I had a question earlier about, you know, is it uh, a friend of mine, actually an editor of a magazine was like, well, is, is it sharp at 600? And this is at 600 millimeters right here, wide open mm. at 600. Um, and it is, you know, tack sharp. I mean, it's absolutely, that's at 200%. So we we're, were kind of maxing out my, uh, my, my camera at that point. But, um, but this is, this is just gorgeous. Like, I, I don't know what else I could ask for, to be honest with you. So, Beautiful. uh, very sharp at 600 wide open. Um, what else? William, I, what was it like? Another, what? You want to see another moose? So I'm just going to show you another, this is the you, same. You guy. know, you know, I do. <laughs> wow. Uh, what, this, what is it like uh, when you're shooting at those, those focal lengths for, you know, normally the longer you go, it's harder to keep stabilized. Do you shoot with a monopod tripod? How, how is the weight distribution? We actually had a question come in about the weight distribution. Yeah. You know, um, with the, uh, with the DSLR version of this lens, I absolutely was, I almost always had it on sticks. Um, every photo you've seen so far has been handheld. So I have Wow. I'm using the OS, the optical stabilizer in, in mode one and uh, mode one, I think that's the proper terminology, you know, in the non panning mode and I'm just hand holding this um, and it's super sharp. So here I'm at one four hundredth of a second at 322 millimeters wide open and just holding it handheld. And that's, you know, what we're getting. It's very nice, very crisp. That's an ISO 1600 as well. So kind of a testament to everything working very nicely together. And look how cool these paddles are. Are you kidding me? Like this little chocolate vanilla swirl. Um, this is what they call the velvet. <laughs> and in the next few weeks here, they're going to be getting rid of all this velvet. So I'm going to go find them here in about two, three weeks because they'll be rubbing that against trees and rocks and brushes and it all just come off in a big bloody kind of a crazy looking thing. So, um, so I'll have some more to share with you in a little bit. Uh, this is a different moose, different day, but just kind of showing you, you know, that soft focus in the front. I'm just using those wildflowers up front. And then he's in the background there. Um, and I'm just tracking him as he walks through uh, the scene here. Um, what else? Oh, I did want to show you guys this one too, just because this one cracks me up. This is a marmot, if anyone has ever seen a marmot before. But what got me about this photo is look at this right here. Again, I don't know how it's going to translate, but I can see the... You know, the resolution is so good. I can see the little antenna of the mosquito on the nose of this uh, marmot here. And, you know, my computer is really slow. Don't worry. I just ordered a new one. There it is. It's now <laughs> clipped into place. You can see the legs and the antenna on the mosquito. I mean, are you kidding me? That's just wow. like too cool. That's awesome. So, um, Hold on, I'm gonna, here we go. I'm gonna click out of there. Anyhow, so that was a couple of quick examples of just how well the, the resolution is awesome. The speed of the autofocus, as you saw, is really good. Uh, the opti optical stabilization is awesome. Hand holding at 1 400th while shooting at 520 millimeters. I mean, and, and just getting crisp, sharp images is just a testament to, uh, to how good that optical stabilizing system is. Now, can we talk a, a little bit more about that, you know, in, in regards to limitations? Um, I say that we have a question from Susan Knapp. Uh, welcome, Susan. Join us from YouTube. Uh, Susan's a high school sports photographer and needs the reach of the 150 to 600, but needs it to go down to F2.8 to shoot those <laughs> night games. Um, so, of the SIG monster. Um, yeah, 600 <laughs> to would be like this big around in the front. And yeah, we they, that lens exists. <laughs> Not quite the 600 to 500. So, um, Susan, if you want to look up the SIG Monster and you can see what it, what optically it takes to get a 600 at 28, that basically doesn't exist um, that I know of. Does that exist as a lens? F4 would be the fastest. Yeah, where, yeah, where, where would you where would you point, Susan? We're in the business of helping people out, Susan. What what direction? I mean, I think I think I mean you probably get this a lot, Liam, because you shoot a lot of different telephoto ranges, and you get yeah. the people who are like, "Do I go seventy to two hundred? Do I go one hundred to four hundred? Because not everybody out there has the ability to just say, "I'll take one of each." 
Right. You know, right, some right. people have like, look, these are expensive lenses. You know, it, it, people are investing in their glass and their gear. And, you know, you have some passionate hobbyists out there that say, look, I, I want one lens that's going to cover the range that's right for me. So right. for most people who are out there just trying to take pictures of the wildlife they see, maybe sports games, you know, kids playing soccer, football. Is there a direction? Is, is, does this lens f- fill a, a gap nicely there? Well, I mean, to, to answer her question real quick, if she needs that 2.8 speed, Sigma does make a 120-300 f2.8, um, which if she's shooting DSLR will work beautifully. Uh, a lot of sideline photographers use that lens uh, specifically for kind of night and dusk shooting. Um, and there's also a 500 f4 that Sigma makes. So a lot more reach, uh, faster as far as light gathering capabilities. So those are two really good options for Susan right there. Um, you know, th- this lens is fantastic. Would I consider it a night game? lens i don't know maybe i mean the cameras go shoot very well at iso 1600 iso 3200 iso 6400 so you can really push your isos and get some high quality images um even at f63 which is you know you saw everything i shot there it was all daylight or you know it it was kind of shadowy i was shooting at iso 1600 the images look nice and clean um but you know the 150 600 28 that's just that's you know that's just not happening um but there are options and this is a really good one for her yeah a lot of it it comes down to the for for those who are are wondering you know why it comes down to just physics and you know the to create a lens like that it's a lot more physically different and and the physics behind it are different and you, you know you'll end up with a whiskey barrel Right. But nobody wants to put a whiskey barrel on the front of their mirrorless, the front of their mirrorless lens. I mean, yeah. one thing that impresses me about this lens is the size of it and, and the weight. And for those that, that have been shooting since the DSLR days or earlier, you really understand the importance of switching to mirrorless. And I, I think for a lot of people, you switch to mirrorless and then you get these big clunky lenses and it's like, well, wait, I rather would have had my old clunky, heavy DSLR to balance out the weight of the lens. So yeah. moving in the direction of lighter glass and glass that's more compact. And, and I should, I should point out too, that to answer the, the other gentleman's question about the balance, um, Aaron mentioned this at the beginning, but the front element is a lot smaller. This one is uh, it's 95 versus 105. And then the other thing is that the lens hood isn't a bit, the other lens hood is really heavy, which is great because it's going to last forever. This is a much lighter composite. So when you are extended out, it's going to be a much, it's not going to give you that dropping feeling, um, you know, where it's super front heavy. So that, that has been reduced a lot. So I think, um, I think he's going to like the balance of it significantly more. Uh, I'll also note for anyone who's considering using this lens from a, a tripod or monopod. Uh, the tripod collar on the lens is fixed to the lens body, but the plate can be removed and we do offer longer plates. So if you're worried about the balance, uh, having that much weight forward of the lens mount, that there is an option there. You can get a longer, uh, we have both longer flat feet and longer feet that are Arca Swiss compatible natively, if you have an Arca Swiss compatible head. Uh, and getting a longer foot allows you to slide the camera and lens combination further back to get closer to the center of balance where that lens would be at 600 or, you know, out in the, the longer reaches. I love the direction the brands are going with that stuff. Cause you know, if I was, if I was running a, a, a company, I'd just be like, you know what, you want quality, it's heavy, deal with it. And I love how the brands are just like, you know what, we're going to try to make it easier. We're going to, you know, I don't think people realize behind the scenes in the labs and, and the work that's going on with the scientists of people who are just saying, look, you know, we can't make it fit. And then you have to, no, we have to make it fit. We got to provide a better product. And, and that's what's going on behind the scenes. I mean, they really are trying to make a better product. And sometimes it, it means, you know, squeezing 12 into 10. Mm-hmm. So kudos, kudos to Sigma, because I know you guys have been at the forefront of just pushing, pushing, pushing the envelope as far as what should be expectation and what isn't good enough for expectation. So yeah. I just want to throw throw that out there. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot of respect for our design and manufacturing team. I mean, it's, it's, there's something really fun about, uh, as 
similar as some lenses may seem on paper, uh, the fact that every, almost every lens that they're releasing, it continues to push the envelope, uh, not only within our own lineup of um, creating a more usable, more user-friendly, better performing product, we just continue to push that line further and further ahead. Uh, and I mean, I think everyone benefits from it, but it's, a, it's fun to see um, people taking so much uh, pride in, in continuing that and making it easier for more people to be able to approach these uh, lenses and to be able to approach subjects that you know, five or 10 years ago would have been off limits for anyone who's not a professional or a really advanced uh, hobbyist. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the newer people to photography don't realize that to get to 600 millimeters when I was starting in photography, that would have cost you about fourteen or $15,000 to get reach like that. Like, this is amazing stuff. <laughs> this is new. This is not like been around for, you know, Ansel Adams didn't have a 600 millimeter lens. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, even the original like National Geographic photographers didn't. It, well, they probably did. But um. But, you know, like when the first version came out, the DSLR version, and all of a sudden you could get 600 millimeters for, and I forget what the price was, 1800 Does that sound right? Uh, the sport version came out at 2000 Okay, 2000 bucks in 2014 or 2015. That was just like mind blowing. Like all of a sudden you could be a wildlife photographer. And that was not really an option before, you know, it was, it was really cool. So this is just like the next iteration of it is just that much better, lighter, faster, sharper, all that stuff. Um, so you know, that's really cool. And I'm, I'm, I'm the beneficiary of all the work that those guys are doing back in Japan. So I'm, I'm really, you know, excited to be shooting with uh, this lens for sure. Yeah. That is, that is a great point. I mean, I think it's all, it's all relative, but you know, one thing Sigma has always been great at is providing a cost-effective option and not having to sacrifice quality. You know, I, I shot on my, my old DSLR system. I, every time we talk Sigma lenses, I got to bring up my old 34, uh, 1.4 art and it, it didn't leave my camera. And one of the things that attracted me to it was that quality it was the bang for the buck, but it was like, man, I would have paid 500, 600 more dollars for this lens. They could have got more money out of me. I'll take the, I'll take this Don't deal. It's like that. when you walk up to something in the store. Yeah, like somebody switched the price tag. I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm just going to go take it to the register. But uh, that's, that has always been, you know, one of the one of the earmarks of Sigma is just providing outstanding quality at a price that across the industry, just like you said, Liam, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people who are, aren't out there and it's we look, might look at it as an investment, but some people are just like, well, I don't have the money to even consider an investment. Right. And you're opening up the door to everybody, which I think is a beautiful thing. There's, yeah. you know, photography should be for everyone to go out there and enjoy. And it shouldn't just be that you got to settle for an 18 to 55 kit lens. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's how I came into Sigma was exactly that. So, uh, you know, I used to be extremely heavy in the action sports world and, you know, I bought a, I bought the, uh, this is an old lens, a, a, a 10 20 3.5 for an old Canon 7D. Um, and I bought that because it was a hundreds of dollars cheaper. I'm not going to tell, you know, I'm not going to tell a lie. No one's getting rich in, in the outdoor sports uh, photography world. So for me, it was save a few hundred dollars, take that few hundred dollars and go actually uh, go out and actually shoot with it. Um, and, and I start, I got a couple covers with that lens. Then I bought the 7200 2.8 again, you know, it was 1200 bucks. And I think the Canon, oh, sorry, the, um, the, uh, uh, the mainstream version, the brand name version was 22 or $2,400. So I saved over a thousand bucks and I hit one of the biggest covers that you can possibly get in the outdoor sports world. And it was the cover was named Colorado, we're looking at you because the image was so sharp. You could see the athlete's eye through the snow and through the goggle and his eyes looking right out at you. Um, so that's just a total testament to, you know, you can save a few bucks, but, you know, you're not skimping on quality at all. If you're hitting these covers um, that are incredibly hard to hit, then what else can you ask for? I mean, that, that the proof is right there. Yeah, that's why I wanted to look at the images. I mean, I hadn't even seen the marmot picture. Oh yeah, uh, in, in the folder, and it's like when you look at the detail, it's like, oh my god, it's, in, oh, it's yeah. incredible. Yeah, yeah, it, it, really, it is. really is. Like I'm sitting here on my screen on a nice, you know, 4K monitor, and like I'm not kidding. You can see the antenna sticking out of the mosquito's head. You're like, what? That's amazing. That's too cool. So. <laughs> 
Yeah, it, it's funny when you, you're talking about because I, I have noticed, you know, I love your work. I, and I have noticed you do shoot a lot of backlit images, which are Liam, you are the ultimate test for a brand to send a lens and say, hey, go out and test our lens or review it. Because it's like if ever there is a type of photographer that is going to have to worry about all the nightmarish scenarios of, of lens and light bending, it's the chromatic aberration and the backlit photographer right. that that yeah. shoots everything. And it really it, it crushes. I mean, I, I guess, you know, they know what they're doing, uh, getting, getting a lens in your hands because you do it so beautifully. And especially I'm looking at it like everything is in the matrix. I look at everything and like colors and light. And I'm like, Oh my God. I'm like, he's got purple flowers and all green leaves. I'm like, this is just a recipe for disaster. If you have the wrong lens, because right, he, he's right. sitting in there all day trying to correct it. So yeah. 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 And then the elements too, you know, we shoot a ton of skiing and it's just, you know, raining and snow and ice and the whole nine yards and, um, and they just power right through and get the job done. No, uh, that's, that's awesome. I, I, there was one thing that, I, you know, I have my notes here and I always, maybe it's because I review lenses as well. And this is always something that I look at is the minimum focusing distance was actually pretty impressive for a lens of this reach. So I do want to call it out because there are some people um, who are concerned with this, that shoot macro. And there was an image that I, that I had seen of the, uh, the yellow flower and it was a beautiful macro shot. And yeah. it looks like it could have been taken with a macro lens and it's taken with a, an ultra telephoto lens. So the minimum yeah. focusing distance is I think under 23 inches, Aaron, am I correct? Uh, yeah, it's closest focus distance is actually on, a little on the wider side. It's 180 millimeters. And that might seem uh, a little counterproductive as typically longer focal lengths will give you greater subject magnification, but at 180 millimeters, it gets to just under one to three. So uh, the reproduction ratio means it's uh, your subject is going to be approximately a third its life size. So a macro lens is a lens that can do one-to-one. -one. There's still a little bit of a gap there. Uh, but this is a lens that can do really well at subject magnification in addition to compression. Like Not only can it close the distance between you and a subject like an athlete or wildlife, but if you find yourself in an instance while you're out there where you want to get a really detail-oriented shot, this one lens can do that as well. I mean, if you look at shooting on it, you know, anything from a 24 to 50 megapixel full frame camera that one to three is like you're able to crop down it creates creates beautiful images and, yeah, and the way it resolves is just just beautiful yeah well that's a lot we got a lot in yeah i mean we yeah. we, we got kind of we got kind of hit a certain point of like off the rails it's like man i had to look at the time and make sure we weren't going over it, it, it's good <laughs> i love talking gear we got a you know a couple of my favorite people in the industry to come on and talk gear with me so awesome. uh, it's an exciting release i know you guys over there on the sigma side are excited liam when are you not excited to get new gear to try out right Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, everyone wants a brand new lens to go take drag around the field for a while and get some great shots. It's fun. Exactly. Exactly. So is there, is there anything we missed, Aaron? Is there anything I'm looking and I'm like, I think we checked off all the boxes of the stuff that I had written down where that really stood out. I mean, we covered the construction, what it does, the, the makeup, how fast it is, everything. Yeah, if we don't have a stream of questions coming in, I'd, I'd say we probably covered most of the, the main points. Uh, it is going to be shipping at the end of this month, so I, I think that's kind of the last thing I, I wanted to throw out there, that it will be coming shortly. Um, Just yeah. in time for fall photography, best time of the year. Hey, there we go. I, now I, I just got to worry about getting out there to you in, in Colorado, Liam. You know where? I, let's go. I'm right gotta, here. I, I got to make it happen. I got to make it happen. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, you guys did such a great job answering all the questions. I think obviously whenever we do a, a new product release, there's so many questions about like, you know, Aaron, you're supposed to be able to see the future. Uh, <laughs> that's what we want. We, we want to get like that information out of you that you're holding back on us that you don't even know. Uh, but I want to thank you guys again. This has just been great. Um, and I do want to tell everybody out there where they can find Liam and Aaron's work. So guys, tell them where we could check more of your work out. Aaron, Liam, websites, Instagrams. Let's get you guys some love out there. Yeah, um, I do have a budding YouTube channel, so you can find me there. It's just Liam Duran. And then uh, Instagram is Liam Duran Outdoors. And my website is Liam Duran Photography. Nice and easy. 
Uh, yeah, you can find me on Sigma Photos page, um, sigmaphoto.com. We have a page for our ambassadors where you can find more information on Liam. We also have a page for the tech reps where you can find uh, myself and the rest of my team members that cover uh, the dealers in the US. Uh, and then on Instagram, my handle is Sigma Photo Northwest. So Sigma Photo NW. Wonderful. Well, I want to give you guys a huge thank you again. It's always great having you guys on. Uh, we'll have you both back soon, I'm sure. We'll have to get Liam on for another critique with you, Aaron. Maybe that'll be interesting to, to see that dynamic there. Yeah, so we can uh, really I, get into it. I can, I can get off the hook. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, huge thank you to the gentlemen for joining us today and for Sigma for sponsoring today's event. Uh, if you guys do need any more information, of course, you can also check out BNH. You can either call, go online to speak to a tech rep, or we got some wonderful information up on YouTube and our Explorer blog. So be sure to check that out. That is it for me. A huge thank you, finally, for everybody watching us from YouTube, live stream, Facebook, and those of you joining us here on Zoom. As always, can't do it without you. We do it for you. That's it, though. It's been another rendition of the BH Virtual Event Space. Put it in the books. Catch you.